Obviously, we're all here, we all love technology, we all um, love doing things very kind of, well, not always removed from nature, but I think we tend to forget just how much experience nature has. In fact, 3.8 billion years uh, of kind of research and development when it comes to um, being sustainable when it comes to being resilient, when it comes to actually withstanding a hell of a lot of stuff. And then sometimes we kind of, you know, we are humans, we have a little bit of a touch of arrogance that we go, actually, we know better than that, right? Or maybe we don't. So biomimicry um, for everybody who is just getting uh, familiar with the concept or is hearing about it for the first time, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are already really, really into it, like myself, is the simulation of the models, systems, and elements of nature and how we may apply them to solving complex human problems. Because let's remember, we are also part of nature and part of the ecosystem that is the broader, broader ecosystem, not the Ethereum one, which is also part of the ecosystem, so you know. Um, so then, by proxy, just to kind of land this uh, parallel with biomimicry and DAOs is, what are DAOs? There are these networks of humans organizing, I mean, you kind of know, but this is, you know, it, it drives it home that actually complex flow networks in nature and DAOs are really not that dissimilar. And there's a big, big correlation between them because this is a network and it does interact with each other, with the different nodes that are part of it, and it functions because of that. So complex flow networks, they exist everywhere, right? From the small to the broad in biology. And we know this because we keep looking at things like mycelial networks and all of that, but really they're everywhere, right? In every kind of ecosystem, big and small. And so from in these networks, these connections between those nodes, between the components, and the interactions in the activities and states is what makes them function or not. And, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so similar to DAOs, these interactions between cells, organisms, emerge from a predefined set of rules, right? And we saw earlier DAOs, they are kind of connected because of, uh, created upon a set of rules. And then the decentralized process of self-organization because really there is no one unique cell that overrules them all, right? So that is in itself decentralization. It's that interaction and those activities between those nodes and between those components that actually makes the system work. And so here, what we're really looking at in this kind of conversation of where bi biomimicry and DAOs might intersect, might benefit um, DAOs, DAOs from biomimicry is what complex flow networks feature that we can mimic, and then how can we be great nodes in that network, right? So you have the individual and you have the collective, always. They cannot be without each other. Because nature, as we've seen, 3.8 billion years, kind of makes that clear. Um, so the bio-network mimicry, we have these clusters, so nodes exist in clusters. And it's all about that inter-cluster and cross-cluster communication. And as we know again from DAOs, we definitely have to get that right because, you know, we're definitely in the process. And yesterday we were talking about this at Shelling Point in panels there's definitely work, a lot of work to be done there, right? And we, it's fine. We're in the process of, of hopefully getting it right. Plasticity, this is very, very important. Parts of the network react faster than others and that is okay. You do not have to have the same speed of reaction, the same speed of interaction between all of them. And wanting to do that is just gonna set you up for not failure, but just like it's going to be hard. Let's make things less hard for ourselves. And then feedback loops. 
So any deviation in balance in an ecosystem will be corrected by this feedback loop because it will always create this balance of the opposite response to get it back on track. So that's the bio network. Then the node mimicry, uniqueness, diversity breeds strength and resilience. Always remember that. Let's stop homogenizing everything. And this is something that drives me crazy is that we keep wanting at the level that we're in now where we have done a lot of work and we've kind of made a lot of successful strides in our mission to make this a reality, we get to this point where we want to get the uh, corporate model and let's make it all fit in a tiny little box. Let's stop doing that. That's not good. Coordination is everything. Connecting and collaborating with other nodes is key. Again, in my mind, authentic self-interest is increasing connection, not competition. Coordination, everything. And then balance. The strong and weak connections. Again, it is okay that some nodes aren't as strongly connected to others. And that's fine. And making sure that we essentially enable the environment for that to be true is very, very important for us to have a healthy, a he healthy network, a healthy ecosystem. Because balance is not a static condition. So getting to this point where, as we've seen, keeping everything in, let's say not in line, but keeping everything within a good rapport with the other means this. It is a constant dynamic state made of adjustments. We again, in the DAO space, it's okay to change things as we notice that things are not necessarily working or are not necessarily getting us to where we need to be. We need to be in that motion. We need to be in that engaged equilibrium to be very aware of what we're doing and what we're kind of balancing out. And again, speaking of balance and bringing it back to nature, this is what nature does naturally. It has this window of optimum viability that exists in the middle of diversity, AKA resilience, interconnectivity and efficiency. It's in the middle that the sweet spot is. That's where it lies. Excess resilience, of course, gives us stagnation. Think of a forest where it's too much, nothing more can grow. But efficiency, extreme efficiency, leads to collapse. You're making things brittle when you make it too efficient. Think of a man, play, like we ref, uh, reforestation and then we plant things in neat little rows and then you light a match and it go, all goes like brrr versus a jungle, you set a match, it will probably not advance as far, right? Why? Because there's diversity. Because there's tall and short and this and that and a variety of species. What we do when we get to the diversity and all of that, we go straight to efficiency, completely bypassing the middle, completely bypassing the balance. Think austerity, that's what that is. We have a crash, we have like some sort of uh, unstable situation, we go, shit, we need to streamline this immediately because, you know, that's what we've always done. Well, that is unnatural. This is the sweet spot. The window of optimum viability is in the middle. So then what can we do with this dynamic of, okay, nature is like that. We're trying to build these things that are essentially, hopefully, going to replace a lot of what we have now and hopefully get us into a better place. We have to emulate, get that ethos of balance and of um, diversity and efficiency sweet spot in the middle and then reconnect. 
And the emphasis, again, is on learning and emulating these regenerative solutions and hopefully translating them into this new economic system that we're trying to build. Because without it and without first unlearning, actually, uh, learning, yes, but we first need to unlearn everything that we've kind of had drummed into us for so long that it has to be that way and it has to be this way and it has to be efficient and it has to cut out this and cut out that and cut out diversity and everything is homogenized. We have to unlearn that and look into, again, what is always around us and what is always out there, which is the balance, which is the fact that diversity and uniqueness and collaboration and coordination are the things that make it run. And we talk about sustainability so much, yet again, it's never gonna work. It's never going to work unless we understand that the way things are built is unnatural right now. And we can do like, can have all sorts of targets and whatever, it is not gonna happen. And it starts with the monetary system, but you know, we're talking about DAS. Um, and then what I suggest that we take and learn and bring into the DAO ecosystem into our crypto comp complex flow networks are patterns, behaviors, and habits. This is one of the things, and it's, it's my view, it doesn't mean that it's right, but I think creating patterns, behaviors, and habits will help us have a baseline, almost like a skeleton, almost like um, the uh, flow of veins that we have in our bodies, right? have that baseline that, that we can build upon that and we can add flesh to it and we can like move, add movement and add different environments or behave and adapt to different environments. But I believe that this, we should maybe have this baseline skeleton because then what happens is we can start looking at things not from a perspective of Let's try, how can we make this as efficient as possible, but rather, how can we make this move and exist in the healthiest way for the organism? And what role does each node part play in its well-being? Because, and this is Janine Benia, she, uh, you know, she's the mother of biomimicry. When we look at truly sustainable models, the only one that has worked for so long is the natural world. And I think, again, it's so easy to get carried away because we're constantly in this flow of more, what we can do, what can we do with more tooling? Yes, let's put more tooling in, let's do this, let's do this. But why don't we just look and understand how maybe the information should flow? Who should it touch? How should people interact with each other? How should different clusters, work streams, whatever we want to call them, how should they interact with each other? Should they have weak or strong connections? Is it okay that that one doesn't interact with the other? And stop and move away from this pattern that has gotten us so used to, and it is the corporate model, that Everything has to run exactly the same. Everybody has to behave exactly the same. It is not a reality and it's not a natural state. And that's the thing that maybe we can take pause. And I always say this, and I said it yesterday at Shelling Point, that intention and setting that intention and figuring out how we approach this, not from a streamline efficiency, let's replicate the old stuff, not fall into too much diversity because we saw that that causes stagnation. Where is the optimum window of viability when we talk about DAOs and what we're building? And this doesn't just apply to DAOs. It applies to the monetary system, it applies to everything or the, what we're proposing with uh, replacing the current monetary model. I think just pause and looking at what has worked and looking at what we can do is important in my view. You may not agree, but maybe you do. Um, and that's it. So I spoke really fast. I've got like 10 minutes to go. So if there are questions, let me know. Yes. How does it feel to be a good note?
<laughs> so I think, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great. Um, so I think, I think that mindfulness and being mindful, I think that's where it all starts. And I think, again, one of the, well, I already started telling you guys what annoys me, so let's continue. So one of the things that essentially irks me about a lot of people coming into this ecosystem now, when we've seen this before during bull markets, this is what happens, is that people come in without a sense of humility approaching something new. And I remember when I got, and when I got started, what is it now, five years, whatever, long ago, I was so in awe of what the potential of this was that I wanted to be very mindful in doing anything, putting anything out there or using this technology to do something meaningful and impactful and moving things towards something that is a better health for the ecosystem and for the world. My intention was always, how can this make things better? And I think that intention is really, really important because that will define what you're aiming for, what your, uh, what your project is aiming for, how you influence it, because again, the agency with great, whatever, with great power comes great responsibility. And that is true. The agency that we all have and the power that we all have, that is very, very powerful. And having the right intention makes sure that the communication is better. It makes sure that you understand that that should not necessarily move like this or should not necessarily be based on patterns that existed before, but rather on patterns that will make it better. And keeping yourself in check on that all the time. And I get, it's so tiring to do that, which is why so many people don't do that and why I'm so fucking tired. But it's a big thing to try to do that. And that's an exercise and it's important and it's good to do that. Again, in my view. Um, Any other questions? So I have a yoga DAO and I have the vision of creating a wellness metaverse so we can have a global yoga studio for yoga and meditation teachers. Onboarding the yoga community is not easy under the umbrella of pushing them into a Web3 space because they are reasonably tech resistant. Any suggestions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, no, this is comfortable actually. So. Um, we can sit in meditation seat, it's really cool. <laughs> so, it's tough, I, and, and I understand it, and I get it, but then again, I think it's so based on what we've been used to and the patterns of behaviors that we've almost been accustomed to because of the way it's been, right? And we also have, okay, let me, let me start with a much more philosophical tidbit. Um, any change involves loss. People aren't afraid of change, they're afraid of loss. And going from what you're used to to something new involves you letting go of what was. And that in itself, and that will vary wild, wildly and widely between people. Right? And different people looking at things from different ways. Um, you saying that reminds me of um, one of my favorite projects, and I remember it so well, and I miss it. Um, we did a cleanup in the Philippines at the end of 2018, and we onboarded a group of fishermen, fish, fishermen in Manila Bay onto mobile wallets at the end of 2018. And it was weird, and it was hard, and it was an interesting feat in educating from a baseline of we earn money this way, but we could earn it like this and tap into a whole new pool of resource. 
but we're a community that has done this for generations, and now you're suggesting that we do this from a completely, in a completely different way from a completely different angle. But guess what? Some of those guys ended up doing other tasks and earning more crypto once they were onboarded. It all just takes a little nudge, and actually the super simple um, solution for you is learning by doing is the best way. Give them something. Give them something to do and show them how much more it could do. Easiest thing, proof of concept, show and tell. The wisdom is so simple. Anyway, um, but yeah, give them something to do and show them. Figure out something very easy that they can do. And then, you know, maybe they'll hate it, but you'll know. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, so you've been talking a lot about information and communication, um, and a lot of the information for sustainability in nature is like sunlight and environmental, like are there predators around? So what does that type of information look like for DAOs, and how do we communicate it? Are you asking me who the sunshine in DAOs is? <laughs> yeah. You're looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> of um, course. So I think, but that's again something that you just map out, right? And it's okay that we don't know yet. Mm. I think to figure out how things flow and again, how, how things interact with each other is the mapping process. Right now, we're at a stage where it's almost like we're defining and we're finding out what those things are. And we're understanding what the relationships are because actually identifying what the elements are is always and most importantly followed by what the flow, what the interactions are between them. Because like, if you think of a lab and you do a culture of something, right? You wanna grow some sort of bacteria or whatever it is that you wanna grow. You have to create an environment for it. You have to create a soup of things for it to grow. Now, if it doesn't grow, it means that you messed up the soup. The ingredients aren't in the right uh, quantities, they do not interact well with each other, and they affect the organism. And they make it grow, misshapen, or kill it. Identifying what the balance is of that soup is what we need, and this is what we all need to figure out what that is. What's the quantity of this? What's the quantity of that? How does that interact with that? Will they have, like, an explosive reaction? or will they complement each other? And that, honestly, that analogy of the lab is your, the easiest thing to kind of wrap around. And analogies are the best way to navigate all of this because otherwise you're like, wait, what? How the hell are we gonna do this? But it's that. It's what are the ingredients and how they interact with each other? Is it gonna be explosive and destructive or is it going to be nurturing and productive? Again, in my opinion. Um, so you gave the example of like mycelial networks and, um, I think the closest parallel that we've created to that, I think is like the internet. Um, and if you look at mycelium and what kind of things it does in nature, um, the th three main things, like one is like, uh, information communications, so, like sending signals, like stress signals between organisms and stuff like they get sent along these mycelial networks. Uh, and we kind of got that with the internet, you know, being this like global information network. Um, the second purpose is like distributing like resources or like, you know, carbon. So trees, a lot of the energy they get from photosynthesis actually goes back through the mycelial networks to other organisms in exchange for something else. So there's like a value exchange network, um, through this mycelial network. And then we got that with Ethereum. Um, you know, now we can have a global network of value exchange. The third thing that mycelial networks do that we haven't really like figured out or it hasn't like manifested in any way is like decomposition. Mycelial networks are the way in which like things that die get decomposed and the nutrients of those things get like redeployed back into the system. Um, and that process is how nature has kind of like iterated and evolved and improved and how, you know, there's no concept of waste in nature. Waste is like a human invention. Um, you know, everything in nature kind of decomposes and gets recycled and reused. 
So uh, I'm wondering, do you have any like ideas or thoughts on like what that could look like in, in DAOs and you know which bit the, the decomposition? Yeah, like decomposition. Like if we did information distribution with internet and value distribution with Ethereum, what's the next thing that gets us so, to decomposition? I'll, I'll try to keep this brief because I have like 30 seconds. 30. 29, no. Um, so I'll just count it down <laughs> and not say anything. But I think the easiest thing there is things don't make it. They just don't. Not, not everything, like it's an, such a natural flow that some things will die and most things will die. But it, what do you get? The nutrient, the learning, that can be the nutrient that you take out of it. And then in a new organism, you apply that. And you make it better. And you make it more resilient. And that's the evolution of it, right? Because it learns what it's adapting to and what it does and how it then uses it to thrive. And what killed that other organism may make this one thrive because you're applying it in a different way and maybe you were just changing one small thing and then it makes it. Like that soup in the lab. You change one tiny thing and maybe then the organism thrives. And the other thing that I was going to say about the internet, and I know there are, I'm over time, um, is right now what we have with the, with the internet is that it is not intentional. People have to participate in it, right? They have to. In the beginning, people wanted to. Now you have to. And what that does is it removes responsibility from the equation. And I was just at, uh, watching the Snowden keynote at the ZK house. He said this, if you're in a mall, you don't really care about cleaning up after yourself. You don't have that instinct of responsibility. Because you're there because you have to like shop for something or whatever and then you go away. The agency and bringing back the agency to the people who make up the network, who are the nodes, maybe that's what helps also in the organism thriving. So yeah, that's it. Woo. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Simona. For sure, there's a lot of stuff to figure out about human coordination, but thank you. I really lo like your uh, point of view. Thank you so much. So in a couple of minutes, we are going to talk about the future of Web3 UX. So see you in uh, four, four minutes. Thank you. <laughs>